What is an autonomous freelancer and how do I become one? So I thought a fun way to get into what an autonomous freelancer is, is to break down the two words and then kind of stitch them together because it's not, it's not a thing. It's a concept, right? It's theoretical. A freelancer is someone who is hired to work for different companies on different projects. They're not tied to one particular customer. They are self-employed. They're independent, whatever. We all know what a freelancer is. Autonomy in the sense of the word is the act I guess, of self-government. So being governed by nobody. So not even your customers. So I kind of took the concept of how I wanted to work, how I've started to work, and then how I've worked for the last five years and kind of been self-governed as a freelancer. I, I might have a deadline that I set myself because I want to go and do something or I, I want to go help somebody else. I want to come on somebody's podcast. Those are my deadlines. I'm not governed by my boss i'm not governed by my customers they will ask me to do work and it might be by a set time but i'm only going to say yes if i know that i can deliver within that set time so it's all about working on your own terms in your own time and ultimately at your own rate otherwise there's no point in doing it i love that so much it just sinks to my soul i just finished your book and i love so much about your your mindset and your approach to freelancing and freelancing in itself does speak to this value of freedom that a lot of us have, but I think you've taken it a few steps further and really focused on the next level of choice and freedom, and that is that autonomous part. So I love that. And and also something you said that really spoke to me is at the end of your book, you said that your work-life balances focuses heavy on life and I love yeah, that massively. Like, I mean, uh, lots of people get stuck and uh, it's hard, right? I know it's hard. I, I was full-time employed for 10 years before I became a freelancer and I felt the, the pain, the need to do something else, the not wanting to stay late, the feeling bad if you don't stay late, the, the feeling of, I guess, judgment. If you've done everything you've got to do for that day, you've done well, you've performed your tasks, you might be a high performer. You might come in and do that every day. But people think you're lazy or obnoxious because you go home on time. And, yeah. and I always thought that that was a strange concept to me, but it was something that was all around me at the various different jobs I worked at. And I, I didn't have any jobs that I disliked, but I was always aware that only a select few people were working in a way that I thought was conducive to productivity and happiness. It seemed like everybody was coming to work, sitting at their desks, going for a smoke break, coming back to their desks, mm. going to lunch. It was so routine that even if they didn't do anything during that work time in between, it was fine. And I thought that it's not really what I want to be doing. So yeah, I I always make sure that my focus is on how do I make my life the best it can be? And there has to be a, a big element of that uh, that is work right if you're going to work eight hours six hours four hours ten hours whatever let's you might as well enjoy it right and that's that's easier said than done so it's, it's taken it's taken 10 years of learning an industry to the point where i felt comfortable and confident enough to go and be like hey i could do this on my own i don't need a boss i don't need somebody to guarantee my paycheck just because i'm showing up every day so it took time but I made sure that I crafted it so that my career was mine, really not governed by somebody else. It, it became autonomous. Yeah, I love that. And we'll we'll get more into the steps of how to do it because you can't just, I mean, I think a lot of people would wish for that, right? But you actually do have to take very deliberate steps and do, you have to make different decisions and use different strategies to achieve what you've achieved. I was also just thinking as you talked about that, like I think in, in my experience, one of the biggest factors of that assumption that work has to be a certain way and that if you're lazy, if you don't want to work extra hours or whatever is just coming from a working class background. That's what I grew up with. You know, it's like feeling lazy for um, for not wanting to work more than 40 hours. Isn't it crazy that it's viewed as a bad thing 
to work fewer hours because you've done your job better yeah. in comparison to being a good thing for working longer because it takes you longer to do your job because okay there are some circumstances let's let's not get too crazy there are some circumstances where things are time based and things go wrong yeah fine but sometimes things take longer because you're not as good as other people at them or as good as you should be at them and that might mean that hey go do something else or you need to pause doing and start learning to make yourself better at that particular skill but yeah the 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 mantra of or i guess the lack of questioning as to oh dom's working late tonight that's fine not why is dom working late tonight versus oh hey dom finished at 12 today we need to go tell his boss like isn't that crazy yeah not Dom got finished by 12. How awesome is that? It's, right. Something's wrong. It's and it's it's jealousy, it's envious, it's it's this horrible mantra that suddenly everyone to my age has been brought up with. It's kind of this legacy inheritance that we got. Yeah. I love one of the things that you say fairly frequently is that you're basically, and I'm sure this is not all the time, but mostly you're done by 2 p.m. And I love that because I, I've just recently made the transition to like really embracing being a freelancer. And one of the things I've noticed is that there's a difference between hours worked and billable hours worked. I don't know if this is just because I'm a newbie and I really feel that it's like when I'm billing for something, I really, I don't distract myself. I very, I'm very focused. Whereas any job that I've had, it's like, well, yeah, you're, you're in a building for eight to 10 or 12 hours but you're not necessarily like focused working. You're taking coffee breaks. You're, you know, whatever, talking with other employees. But when I'm doing billable work, it's like, this is my laser focus. And and I actually can't work more than like maybe six of those in a day so far. Mm. Again, maybe that's because I'm a beginner, but I've just noticed that difference like in the billable hour thing. Is that something yeah, you've experienced as well? There's, there's, there's two, there's two, concepts really that constitute me working the same way right if i'm working on one billable deliverable today i know that i'm going to get that done quicker and probably better than if you were to give me the whole day to do it if you were to pay me the whole day mm. to do it I'm, i know that i'm going to get it done because i've got the motivation to finish it not quickly but efficiently so i don't have to do it again i don't have to come back and check it i don't have to borrow some time from tomorrow to go back to it if i know that i can complete that complete not work on complete that deliverable today what might be part of a deliverable it might be three chapters of an ebook or whatever um i know that once that's done i could do something else that's my incentive to do it to the best of my ability. And this doesn't really have anything to do with freelancing. I've worked that way my entire life, right? Finish that thing, move on to the next thing because it's done then, right? Um, my, I guess the con the concept comes back to, I guess I have a, a bit of a, a cheat code in my previous, my last full-time job was as a business consultant and we were targeted on billable days. So there are however many billable days in a month, 21, 22. After that, we got commission on more billable days. So you could just collect your salary, work and bill those amount of days. But the way that the salespeople, the directors sold those packages were that, oh, this project is going to take 25 billable days. Now, that doesn't mean I have to sit and spend 25 billable days on that they know that it's going to take 25 days worth of time, yes, but also resources, templates, experience, yada, yada, yada. In one case, it might take me 35 days, and I'm not going to make any commission, but we've kind of covered it. It's it's paid for. In another case, it might take me five days, because actually it's all calling upon my experience and work I've done for somebody else and templates that I've done for somebody else. Research that we already have, but did take time and therefore should be billed for somewhere. That's that's how a business makes money ultimately, right? So I think I was, I was always working in this way where I wasn't just present in an office, I was working. 
and I said I said in my book that the one it wasn't just one day, but at one one tipping point, I just went home. There wasn't any working from home, but I was like, I could just do this at home and I could do it better and quicker. And I wouldn't be surrounded by people just being loud all day. And I wouldn't have to walk through all the fumes on the cigarette break when I want to go out and get a <laughs> coffee. Like my life would be better. My work would be better. Let's just try it. And guess what? It was. And nobody minded. And then other people started to do it. So I think there's there's the two concepts of being present wasn't enough for me to just sit and collect a paycheck in, in both worlds. Um, but also recognizing that, yeah, if I'm working on a billable object today, I want to earn X amount. And that might be half of that blog post because it's a long blog post. But it also might be, I just need to do one blog post and it's a topic that is something that's so just second nature to me i'm so passionate about i have all the first hand knowledge because it's a job i used to do i can knock it out in a couple of hours but another blog post might take me like i said two four days mm. it doesn't matter what i'm charging as long as I've, I've got it done i'm happy and it might be 2 p.m it might be 9 a.m as long as it's done it's done right that's it my own kind of virtual paycheck is collected then i can either move on to another project and twice what i would normally that day or go to the beach, or take a course, or read a book, whatever. Yeah, you have a lot of boundaries, and I would love to talk more about that. So we kind of talked about the freelancer part of autonomous freelancer. What are the mindsets, tools, some of the things that that you thought about as you were really pivoting into the autonomous part? Like, why did you choose the word autonomous? Um, this is a good why question. Is that? Yeah. I stole and it. <laughs> you stole it. Okay. Yeah. So um, Tom Hurst, who is a great follow on Twitter for all freelancers, independent consultants, whatever. I think he's just at Tom Hurst with an I, Tom Hurst. Um, he wrote a tweet, the day in the life of an autonomous freelancer. And it was just like, went to the gym, took my kids to school. That's a lie. I don't think his kid's old enough to go to school. Um, did something with my kids, played with my kid. Did a bit of work, went on someone's podcast, did a bit more work, went shopping, went to the park, did a bit more work. That was it. I've, the, and that was like, that's exactly how I work. Like, that's exactly like what I do. It's like, I'll just do whatever I want, whenever I want, as long as I get my work done. Most of the time, and I mean like 95% of the time, I start work at half 7 a.m. and I finish as soon as I can finish. But sometimes I might be doing other stuff, right? And I might be might be a Sunday morning. I've got nothing to do. And I'm like, or if it's raining, if it's raining, that's the big one for me. I'm like, I'm not going to do anything else. I might as well just write that blog post that I need to do tomorrow. So I get ahead of my workload. So he wrote that and somebody replied saying, damn, I'd read a book called the autonomous freelance. And I was like, <laughs> Hey Tom, do you want to write this book? And he was like, no. So I wrote it. <laughs> oh, that's so amazing. Yeah. So I stole it. I got permission and um, it happened. And I started writing it in I don't know, March last year, maybe February, March last year. I was kind of done by the end of July. And then the uh, the publishing process was was awful. Oh, no. <laughs> it took me so long to publish a book. Well, I'm glad you did. Like you said, it's called The Autonomous Freelancer. And I love it. It's great. Like I said, it does cover the basics of like the freelancing mindset, but I really love that you focused on the autonomous part because that's very aspirational to me. I value my autonomy a lot. I mean, that's maybe my highest value as a human being generally. Yeah, so one of the reasons I avoided freelancing my entire career is that I had this image of working for other people means I have no autonomy because ultimately they dictate when I'm working. And this is probably coming from like a blue collar working class mm. area and family and everything. That's just the way work is. You know, you have a, a boss and the boss tells you when you work and how much money you make and they can get mad at you for no reason. And, you know, so I had all this, this emotional baggage I was bringing into it. Um, but now that I've actually gotten in and, and especially with your philosophy as a model, I'm I'm so excited. I'm like, I got so excited at just as you're describing your or Tom's day or your day, the way that you value, you know, taking walks, going to the beach, like that stuff is so enriching and fulfilling to me. 
and I love work too. I do love, you know, I love marketing. I love strategy and thinking. And I can tell you love writing, you know, that's, it's so cool. Those, um, those, those two components, right. Being able to do kind of what I want and recognizing that I love my craft are the two reasons of why I do what I do. I'm a freelance content writer, but they're also why I do it well because of the two together. If I was a full-time content writer for company ABC, mm. sure, I'd be good at it. I would enjoy it. But if I was writing for the same client every day, would I get bored of it? Maybe. I don't know. I, I've had six-month retainers where I've just worked for one client and it's been great and we've made some great results and there's definitely a need for that. And I think every freelancer should do that. I think there's a lot of people that I talk to that like, they, they want to be a freelance writer immediately and they have no worldly knowledge. They have no industry expertise about anything. Mm. But, well, how do, you, how do you expect to just become a writer? Uh, that's something that I'm a little bit passionate about as well. Go get a full-time job, then become a freelancer. Or if you really don't want to go down that route, then you need to specialize in something. Mm. But it's it's that combination of being freelance and a content writer not just being freelance and doing whatever or just being a content writer and writing all day. The two of those is just where really my work-life balance comes together and and is at its at its most optimum, I guess. Um, but, but as you mentioned, going for walks and going to the beach every day, they are rewards, I guess, for finishing early or doing good stuff and then needing to take a break. But they're also part of my process. Yep. I wouldn't be, and I know this because I wasn't, I, I wouldn't be as productive or as efficient or as inspired to go and write a new blog post if I didn't have that break after two and a half hours, go and walk the dogs, come back, work for an hour, be able to have lunch at a time that I prescribe, you know, like when you're hungry, not just within that yeah. time slot. And all those small, tiny things to be able to go, you know what? I'm just staring at a screen. A screen. I'm going to stop. I'm going to go do something else. I'm, and it might be something that is so unthought of in the working world, but you need that distraction, right? Sometimes I'd go and turn the PlayStation on because I need to switch off. Like I can't write about SharePoint anymore. I'm done, <laughs> yeah. I'm done with SharePoint. I need to go and play Formula One. Yeah. And your mind just completely switches off. And then you come back. I'm like, oh, hey, I just wrote another 500 words. That was easy. Uh, dude, I, I feel that so much. I just felt it last night and I forgot. I forget. I go through periods where I forget this because when you're sort of at a lower paradigm, you just think, oh, yeah, nice for you to say you have the the time and the money to to go for walks and stuff. But actually, no, it is a it is a real phenomenon that last night I was like, I was like, man, I'm really stuck with what I need to do next strategically for my budding uh, freelance business. And I went, I just went for a walk because I like walking and I'm in a, you know, beautiful place and the weather's nice. And man, ideas were just exploding in my mind. That wasn't even why I went for a walk, but it just happens. And I oh, was yeah, like, yeah. oh, I totally forgot about this. <laughs> I, I, it, yeah. It works so much that I'm kind of, I get to the point sometimes where I'm like, oh, I'll go for a walk. That'll give me some ideas. I'm like, no, that is not. I'm not going for a walk to get ideas. Right. And I have this notes page on my iPhone and it's one page and it's one page intentionally. Like if I wanted to be organized and go for a walk to do that activity, I would have a Trello board with all my cards and everything. But I have this one notes page that is just stuff that I think of on my walks. And I keep it on one page so that I can scroll back to and be like, yeah, this is part of my process. Like people aren't paying me for the deliverable of going for a walk. But it's part of my process to take a break and something might come to mind or I might remember something or I might see something. It's yeah. part of my day to day. It's the same as having a meeting with the sales folks on a Monday morning to work out what the pain points are. But yeah, your morning. clients are paying mm -hmm. for your clear thoughts and your organized thoughts and your strategically insightful thoughts. The big the 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 question I get when I explain that kind of concept to people is, well, how do I build for that? Mm. And those questions come from people who itemize every line item, right? Yeah. You might write three hundred words of copy for a website, 
but that website is going to make that company hundreds of thousands of dollars. You're not billing per word you've written that on that website because those 300 words might take you 300 minutes. They might take you 10 minutes, but they also might take you like 10 days and you need to craft those into, it needs to be smaller copy. It needs to be short form. It needs to be succinct. It needs to, it needs to make that business money, right? So if it is part of your process to write those 300 words, leave them, go do something else. It's all part of your process. You don't need to write, I went for a walk. Some clients ask you to do that. Get rid of them. They're terrible. They're never mm. going to pay you good money. But factor think, in everything in your process. Yeah, I think that's where other things you talk about a lot, like finding the right niche. Like you can kind of get ahead of all of these problems by getting really good at your craft, focusing really well on a niche, choosing the right clients so that, you know, like right now I'm in Upwork and I, I'm very frustrated with the fact that they really incentivize hourly work. Yeah. And I'm kind of stuck in that thing. Cause I'm like, I, you don't know this on the other side as a client, but I will do my best for you. But hourly work doesn't incentivize that hourly work actually incentivizes me to do worse, but of course I won't, you know? So it's like, ah. Oh, Man, I just, I, I build for two minutes to look at your sales page, but actually that's 15 years of copywriting and marketing knowledge into yeah. those two minutes. And I'm only getting paid, you know, whatever. And so your model and your, you know, I definitely want to get into my business being more like yours, where you're working with certain types of clients that, you know, they're sort of vetted ahead of time. So yeah, the, the the niche component is probably the biggest thing to unlock for for freelancers right when you find your niche you become extremely good at it you become known for it people come to you so that's time you don't have to spend on marketing and that's you spend more time in there naturally so you're always learning about that um that particular industry your point on your 15 years of experience versus your two minutes of build time is it's a real Upwork horrible thing, isn't it? And this is I've I've never used any platforms like Upwork or anything for work, and I never will, um, because this they, they scare me. They scare scare me into things like hourly work. Um, my friend Ollie, who roasts landing pages for a living, which oh, is a great a great I've job. Actually, right? it's a great worked job. for a no client that used his service. All oh, right, yeah. So he on his order forms I'll, I'll read you what it says so this is after you've paid right you pay 350 dollars for the roast which is normally about half an hour but you're not paying for half an hour's time and i think if you've booked it at this point you appreciate that you're you're, you're booking an expert who he's now roasted 850 SaaS landing pages he, he knows this inside out right his um order confirmation says your roast will be sent back within 48 hours of your intake form being completed this doesn't include weekends as I spend those seeing my family and drinking wine on my own. I love it. And his kind of awareness of or making everybody else aware that, you know what, I'm a human as well as a mm. business, mm. I think is such a big part. And that's something that Upwork removes yeah. because it's just, it's, it's transactional, it's non-human and it's like per minute billing, which is, what about when I need to recharge? What about my 15 years of experience? What about all the money I've made for all these other customers in this particular industry with my specific skill set? Yeah, you're not paying for that on Upwork. So either you are getting somebody who will do anything for money, which is, I like to call it like slavery, not salary. Mm -hmm. That's nobody wants to do that. And, or it's people that, don't know there's another way and i would rather hire the i would rather hire the person that knows there's another way is aware of all these other worldly experiences you can have that is more productive mm. because they're not sat there on logging their the process of logging time on anything doesn't need to happen and rem, it removes time from the day you're losing time <laughs> logging time to get paid for your time it, it just doesn't makes sense right and i get some people they they need to start somewhere and fine but i would say start by getting really good at your craft 
get some nice case studies and you don't have to write the case studies you could just need some example clients and you can I, I hate writing case studies right i made a whole video about how i hate writing case i saw studies. that video yeah and then I, that's the only case study i wrote off the back of that video <laughs> i've not written another one but people know that i've worked with Re, uh, mio ring central cisco modality systems because i talk about them right mm. it's much easier for me to tweet hey i got this customer to number one on google with my blog post Hey, we just made a million dollars and there were, all the blogs are attributed to my blogs. Like it's easier for me to just do that sporadically than go, right, I need to write this case study today. Because mm. one, I don't like doing it. And two, nobody's going to read all of it, but they are going to read the whole tweet, the whole LinkedIn post. And it's different, like in B2B, if someone's going to spend a million pounds on enterprise software. They will, they will read the case study. They will phone that customer and have a reference call. But when hiring a freelancer, they need to see that your output is what you suggest it is. Mm. And that's that's what I do, right? Instead of documenting my time, I do that. I want to talk about the niche part because I think it's related to what we're talking about now. And you said something that I thought was awesome. You said, I find that a lot of people don't understand what niche really means. And I also want to introduce that my perspective as a beginner and also as a person with ADHD, I'm interested in lots of different things. I've worked in many different industries over the years doing just doing marketing. I spend my free time looking up different niches for affiliate marketing and stuff. I love variety in business, in creativity, and the... When I started digging into freelance content and everybody was saying you find a niche, that was like a like a dagger in my heart. I was like, no, I don't want to. I, I would love to be a marketing generalist or whatever, right? Because that's what I am. But um, everybody was like, dude, you got to pick something. Just, you know, and and so I want to hear your thoughts on that. Um, just ex explaining it to you kind of emotionally, like what it felt like to me as a being in the beginning process, it's like, I don't know, I could be, I, I have experience with all these different skills. I've never worked for just one industry. You know, it wasn't a very easy decision for me. And yet I'm seeing the profound effect of having picked a niche now. So, so yeah, I want to, I want to ask, you know, what do you mean by people don't really understand what a niche really means? And also what are your thoughts on, on my process of, uh, finding a niche and finding it painful. Yeah. So I think to your point around people and you being afraid that going super niche means doing the same thing every day and getting bored mm -hmm. very quickly is because you're unaware of what niche can actually be, right? Which goes mm -hmm. back to my first point. So I, I, I say, I call out in my book, I say this a lot online um, and I run freelance mentoring sessions and people are like, oh, I need to find my niche. And I'm like, okay, where do we start? And everyone says SaaS. So I mm. I, I feel like ending the call there. I feel like just like <laughs> closing the phone down. I'm like, SaaS isn't a niche. And this is the biggest one. And I reference it in my book. So if you Google SaaS, no, if you Google types of SaaS, you get accounting SaaS, content management SaaS, customer relationship SaaS, enterprise resource SaaS, project management SaaS, communication SaaS, HR SaaS, billing SaaS, lots of SaaS. And everything that precedes SaaS, that's a niche, right? Mm. Someone that writes accounting SaaS, like fintech content, should be good at fintech. They should understand tax and cryptocurrency and how banking works and stuff like that. The SaaS part is kind of irrelevant. The Soft software, everyone knows what software is, right? So no one's a specialist in software. You might be a specialist in a particular software or a particular group of software. And the as a service is the deployment model. It's, it's in the cloud, it's subscription-based. So really all you're saying is you're a, your niche is what, what online apps, which how many of there are those? Um, but accounting is very specialist, right? You, you might be an accountant, and write some content on it. You might have had a background where you were an accountant, you've done an accounting course, blah, blah, blah. The same applies to HR. But I don't know anything about HR or accounting, but I can write about SaaS. 
but really what that means is you can write really kind of top funnel content. You can write about productivity and actually it might be an HR SaaS app that might help you. And the actual HR content gets done in house by someone who is an HR specialist. Mm. So, and those, those people either in house or the specialists in HR are getting paid better money than the people writing the generalist content because there are more generalists out there and it's general. So more people are qualified to write it. Like anyone, almost anyone can write 20 tips on how to be productive at work, but only a select few people can write high quality content on how that HR software will deliver those benefits and solve your pain points and, and stuff like that. So niche doesn't mean SAS. It doesn't mean a writer. It might mean a type of writing, and in my book, I reference uh, Joel's case study buddy business. He writes B2B case studies. And when I was thinking about including that, I was kind of like, is that niche enough? And it is because he's very prescriptive on, I'm not going to take on this customer for that. No, I'm not going to do written work outside of the case studies. I'm sure he does write blog posts and stuff, but his business model is he writes case studies for businesses that are willing to spend enough money on a good case study, right? His audience is, it could be anyone's case study, right? And the audience is the entire world. But his audience is people that will spend this amount of money, recognize the importance of a case study, are B2B. He's he's getting, he's closing the parameters. Mm -hmm. And what he's doing there is he's becoming more and more niche as you close, or as you introduce more filters, I guess, into who your target customers are. And it's easy to say that and understand that if you've done lots of marketing exercises and you're familiar with businesses and how they work and you understand terminology like ideal customer profiles and buyer messaging documents and things like that, customer personas. But if you don't know who yours is, you, you're you open to finding the wrong customer because you're looking for any customer. So that's not niche. Niche is when you know exactly. I know that my, the perfect customer for me is a either someone who's in the UCAS, that's one of the potential SASs, uh, UCAS or CCAS, another potential SAS, Gartner Magic Quadrant, or one of their partners that needs a content strategy in place or needs someone to fill a gap and write some content for a strategy that's already been executed. Those are who I want as my customers, right? Why? Because I have a background in telecoms i'm a good writer i understand the level above being a writer the strategy elements what do we need to write who do we need to write it for that's my niche it's very prescriptive it's not hey i'm going to go and write some content for anyone to your other point of is that boring and scary and what happens when i start writing about that if you look at my list of current clients which is this really technical uh, whiteboard <laughs> Um, they all do something different, right? They all do something completely different. So one is a Microsoft Teams provisioning portal. One is a SharePoint integration. Uh, one is a middleware that brings together four different apps, two that I didn't mention then. We've got another one that's project management software. We've got some automation testing in there. We've got a managed service provider. We've got a newspaper, effectively. Um and there are different people on there, right? They're all completely different, but they're in my niche. It might wow. be a different app. It might be a different way of working. It might be a different piece of equipment, but it's all within the same niche because there are so many different pieces to any industry, right? So I think the the short answer to finish my very long answer is that niche doesn't mean doing the same thing every day. It means being very good at a specific skill in a specific industry. Wow. Yeah. That's it. It just may be a fundamental misunderstanding that some of us have of, of the universe. <laughs> and what I mean is it's almost like you describing like the words you were using to just describe your general niche. I'm completely unfamiliar with. I have no idea what most of those things mean. And so you're already in a, in a tiny little micro niche. And then within that micro niche, you're it's like turtles all the way down. It's like a fractal thing of like niche. Yeah. It's like niches all the way down, you know? 
Uh, but there's, there's a there's a cool element as well. When you become, I say cool. Uh, that's not the right word, is it? It's it's very it's business generating. It's extremely helpful to be the one of few people or the only person or one of few, I guess, top rate people doing your craft in your industry. That if something new comes along and nobody knows how to categorize it, like, mm. oh, it's kind of like what Dom writes about. So we'll see if Dom wants to write, wants to write about that. So I've been doing a lot of stuff with asynchronous video. So apps like Loom and Teller and mm. all the various ones that have popped up now. Who's going to write about those beforehand, before there was a category? Like, well, it's kind of like video conferencing, but but for remote workers. And hey, what have I been writing about my entire career? Video conferencing and remote working. So natural assumption was I got a referral uh, from Ollie, actually, who I mentioned earlier, who said, you should go hire Dom. He writes about this all the time. And they were like, how can he write about this all the time? We only just started our company and this is new. No, but he writes about that. He's already writing about it. So go hire him. And they did. So 11 months of last year, I wrote, four blog posts a month for them. And that wasn't necessarily within my niche because it didn't have a home yet. Asynchronous communication, is that part of, what is it part of? Digital collaboration tools or something else? Yeah. And you you also said something in your book, which was like a, a remedy for me to this niche problem, which is you know, and it can, it, we get blocked from thinking the, of these things, but of course you're like, Hey, you also can work for other clients. Like, oh, yeah. this is the way to be really, really efficient for both you and your client to make more and more money faster and faster because you're gaining all of these, uh, efficiencies, you know, you don't have to work so hard to understand the content. So that means, that you can provide more value faster to your client. You don't have to do as much research or your first draft out of the gates is going to be so much better than the average generalist writer that you can start charging more. But you can also just work for other people, you know, to scratch the itch of novelty if you want or yeah. to or to build your skills, you know, a little more to challenge yourself creatively. You can just take on other writing clients. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I kind of forgot that I'd included that part. And the the process of writing this book for freelancers about running a freelance business, how you'd like to, that's not my niche. Yeah. So the the whole, it was, it was a little bit meta yeah. that you brought it up that I wrote a book for freelancers, which is not my audience on any platform. It kind of is now mm. um, because I kind of went all in on Twitter as a freelancer because people that are going to hire me for communications content and digital collaboration tools content ironically aren't hanging out on twitter they're hanging out on linkedin so yeah. I, I kind of reserve my linkedin for hey i'm a marketer for this industry and my twitter is hey i'm a freelancer and i'm here to help other freelancers that's what i use the, those two platforms for but the process of writing a book for freelancers was not nothing to do with my niche so mm. to your point yeah i mean you can you can still do other stuff but if you focus on your the primary source of your income being where you specialize, you will grow as a freelancer a lot quicker than you will somebody trying to cover every topic under the sun and bidding for every project and sending cold emails about, hey, can I write for something for your company when you don't even know what they do? Yeah, and I've seen this fractal effect at work in – Upwork as well. I mean, the first few profiles I made were like, I'm a marketer. I can do SEO and Google ads and Facebook ads, whatever. I was just trying to get something. And the first thing that I got was somebody who was looking for SEO, but they wanted to do it on their YouTube channel. I was like, yeah, I could. I mean, I have a YouTube channel I, and I know SEO. So, all right. And then I was like, I got another one for, for YouTube. And I was like, okay, Maybe there's something there. So I reformatted my whole profile to just YouTube focused. And then I started getting a lot more success on my on my proposals and stuff uh, because, you know, people are like, cool, you're the YouTube guy instead of being you're the marketer guy, which there's a million. Yeah. yeah. And then and then as I got into YouTube as a niche, it just kept there was more and more. It's like, oh, wow, I could just be YouTube for 
crypto people if I were really into crypto, right? Like to your point, like that's actually the niche is not even YouTube, right? Yep. It would be the crypto. And I haven't figured that part out yet. You know, I'm kind of, all my clients are in different areas and, but I can see there's more friction to me working with somebody in the finance space because I'm so unfamiliar with that world. And one of my yeah. clients is in finance or another one is in comedy. I'm like, that's just not me. I like comedy as a consumer, but I'm not, you know, but then I have another client that's a course creator and I'm like, I've created my own courses. I've worked for in the information, um, information product world for most of my career. So it's like, that is like, you know, so easy to me to know, like, what is a course, what needs to go in it. Um, and then I can apply those specialty skills, which in themselves, you know, in, in themselves is fractal too. It's like, okay, well, YouTube, well, then there's the SEO part of YouTube, but then there's also the viral part of YouTube. And I'm learning about hooks and I'm learning, you know, I'm going deeper and deeper and deeper on the skill set, which is infinite. And I'm going deeper and deeper. Well, I think my next phase will be finding one of these niches and going deeper on that. But it's kind of like, I just had two ideas racing through my mind as you were talking. You've got a video about the easiest way to start writing SEO blog posts, right? And one of them is to start with the easiest things to rank. And those are the longer tail keywords. They are super specific. Like you're not going to rank for video marketing for YouTube overnight, but you might rank for video marketing for YouTube for cryptocurrencies or a specific cryptocurrency. That would be a better one, wouldn't it? For Solana. You might rank for that very yeah. quickly. And then you write the same for a different cryptocurrency, or you might write something a little bit different, but it's long tail, it's super specific. That's a good verified SEO strategy. And it's the same with choosing a niche as a freelancer. Mm. The, the, the smaller the audience, the more chance you have of standing out. People then get scared of, oh, it's a small audience. I'm not going to have any work if I... I've had one person DM me and say, I think there are only two clients in my niche. Is this a bad idea? To which I replied, there are definitely more than two clients in your niche. They never replied. Um, I wanted to be kind of like to the point, but maybe I was too to the point because they never replied. Well, they don't really use Twitter that often. Um, but I was like, no, that's that's not the case, right? That's You can pick any industry. There's more than two people in it. Mm. Um, so... Yeah, I think going super specific like your SEO strategy is a is a it's a good comparison to, to starting out as a freelancer. I said there were two things racing through my mind and I tried to get that one out quickly so that I didn't forget the second one. <laughs> I think I've forgotten the second one. So feel free to move on. Well, I love this conversation. Obviously, it's very pertinent to me right now. Um and I and I saw I think a big part of this is is that efficiency and speed. Like the, I could have spent two years trying to get clients on Upwork as a generalist, but as soon as I switched to YouTube SEO, it's like people started reaching out to me, which had never had not happened before. And I think my profile, like I didn't have any testimonials, I hadn't earned very much money, so it's like I got the benefits of that. Uh, I always forget which one's which, but I think it's head. Is it tailwind or headwind? It's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a. I'm not a sailor, but uh, anyways, you you get the benefit of this like wind at your back. Uh, because as soon as I switched over, it's like oh, people are reaching out to me because there aren't that many people providing this service. It's a little harder, I think, to put all the pieces together. But anyways, I saw that and I was like, damn. They were all right. All the people that said focusing, they were right. Um, and and I told myself the same thing that you kind of said in, in your book was like, you know what? This is just my Upwork business. I can do whatever I want for my own projects. I can do what? Long tail SEO, whatever. I can move into different spaces, different niches, different topics, whatever. As an affiliate, you can do anything. But for my Upwork business, why don't I just do it right? You know? There's um there's a there's a thing Alex Hermosi says that's like a way to stay poor or whatever, but it's just a good mindset, which is a way to stay poor is to um do your best instead of doing what it takes. And it's it's like 
I could have just been like, well, I'm doing my best. I'm trying to show all my experience and I'm trying to write these long things. But instead, I finally was like, I'm just going to do what it takes. What it takes is choosing a niche. <laughs> yeah. So my, my clients, some of my clients hire me and say that we need you to tell us what we're doing wrong. Like they hire me, they pay me money to tell them what they're doing wrong. That's quite scary. And some of them say that and they don't really mean it. They're like, no, we just want you to write some blog posts or create a content strategy and we'll go and execute it. One customer I'm working with at the moment embraces that. They send me something like, no, this is terrible. This is not this is not wrong because I think it's wrong. This is wrong because it's not going to make your business money. Mm. And that's what they appreciate, right? The, the fact that we're talking about business, not just my craft. And I, I apply that into everything that I write. Every blog post is a marketing asset or a sales enablement asset or a knowledge base article, whatever that has a value. People will pay me a thousand dollars for an article. If it's got the potential to make them a $100,000 customer, that ROI is incredible. And I think having that mindset as well, will immediately want you to put your rates up, but only when you can justify it. Right. So you have to be in the right niche. You have to show that experience, that knowledge, that background that you are that person that can charge or command is not a word I like to use. You can command that rate. If people ask me to write a blog post that's below my rate, I need a damn good reason to say yes. Mm. And it might be because I just want to work with them. Like I have the freedom to do that as well, right? It's my business. If mm. if I want to if I really want to work with whoever, but they can't afford the rate that I have on my website, I might just want to do it. And some people will say that that's not a growth strategy. It's not, but my business isn't all about growth. I was I was interviewed by somebody who's making a freelance management platform. And they said, so what are your goals for the rest of this year? And I said, well, just more of the same. And they were like, oh, don't you want to grow X amount of money or do this? And I was like, no, I love my job. Why would I want to change it? And they were like, "That's amazing! Oh, wow, nobody's ever said that. And I was like, well, I got to the point where for some, for my day to be better, my working week to be better, something like major has to happen that I'm completely unaware of. And I realize that I'm in a very privileged position, but only because I choose to be, right? I could have not quit my full-time job. I could have not started pursuing freelance, not even pursuing started writing and sharing my writing because I was proud of it. Right? If I never started doing that, we would have never got to the where we are today, where I'm talking to you about the book I wrote on freelancing because I actually became quite good at running a freelance business. And I think it all comes back to the niche element. And the second thing that I remembered now that I forgot earlier is the the hiring process. So you said clients hire you. And I thought about traditional hiring process. And this is why it was running through my head at a million miles an hour, because I was, you were giving me the ideas and I wasn't writing them down. Um, think of a typical hiring process for a full-time role. People are advertising one specific position. They're not calling for someone to come and join their company. Mm. That's how people hire freelancers as well, right? Nobody yes. goes on Upwork. Some people do have YouTube videos. Nobody goes on Upwork and goes, hmm, let's see if anyone wants to work with me today. They go, yeah. oh, I need, <laughs> I need, I need to hire uh, an HR video marketing specialist. So they'll probably type that in. And if you've got the right keywords and the right reviews, you'll pop up. And if you don't, you don't. And if nothing pops up, then they might start to go like higher level, but Really, what they're looking for is that first thing that they typed in. That is an HR white paper or whatever it is. And if you've got that experience and you showcase it, you're more likely to be found. And that, I don't know if that is a good example for Upwork or not, because that hiring person who might not be the hiring manager at that company, but they aren't, they have a gap to fill. The same as if they were hiring an HR coordinator or a, any role. Right, you have that role available. You have a need, you that, that requires fulfillment of some kind. You want a freelancer, so you go to whatever marketplace. It might be your personal connections. You might ask someone for a referral. It might be Upwork. It might be LinkedIn. You put a post out. You might make a traditional job listing. You have a specific 
niche, position, role, job, whatever to be filled. So why would you not hire the person with the most matched skill set? So why would you not want why would you not want to be that person as well? So it all comes back to like to to get the autonomy in your freelance life, you've got to work on how to best enable that yourself. And the core of that really is being the person in your niche. That's beautiful. I noticed that one thing that you emphasized a lot in your book, and I am thinking through this a lot right now, I came in with pretty good instincts because I'm so deeply motivated by autonomy and freedom. But you talked about communication a lot and specifically asynchronous communication. And it's basically something that you, it's a hard line that you draw with your clients. And I haven't heard anyone speak um, as clearly about it as, as I saw that you have. So why is this essential to the autonomous um, mindset? And, you know, why do you focus so much on asynchronous communication? And like, how do you think about it? Because I want asynchronous everything, but yeah. I've noticed that some clients don't like it <laughs> and it, it, yeah. it, it like, it stresses me out on a daily basis that they're just so like, those, yeah. those people immediately are not my ideal customer profile, right? If they want me to be telling them what I'm doing at every point in the day, instead of going and doing it, that there's a disconnect between how we work, right? I would rather take away that hour meeting you want on a Monday morning for me to spend that hour and probably the two hours before, because I start early doing what we're about to talk about. I can then show you it and you can be like, Hey, it's done. Great. Or actually here are the changes you need to make rather than let's just talk about what it's going to look like. I, I am confident in my ability that I understand what you need. Otherwise I wouldn't have said yes. And if there's, if there's not that alignment, then either we're not a good match and I don't want to work with you, or you should go find somebody else and I'll refer them somewhere else. Or we might need, it might be a super technical assignment and we do need to have a call. The, the line I draw isn't necessarily never talk to anyone ever again, because in certain work I do, like content strategies and i'm doing some work at the minute working on messaging and positioning and there needs to be some brainstorming i need to interview mm -hmm. salespeople and customers and stuff like that if the nature of your craft is talking to people then that would be a silly thing to do right stop talking to people but if it's delivering blog posts you don't need to update people on that blog post you need to write that blog post and show them the blog post you might then offer a call to go through feedback but only when they've made the feedback and you've reviewed it. But by that point, you've probably gone through the changes and gone, hey, I've made the changes and that's it. Nobody needs walking through their own blog post with the changes that they want to be made if they've been made kind of in writing, if that makes sense. Yeah. Now, like I said, if the nature of your business is you need to talk to people for this, like for freelance animators it's hard to just present a storyboard without talking through the animations and literally saying the script out loud i get that that's that's a good time not to be asynchronous although you could record a video especially i work with i'm in the uk most of the time i work with us clients most of the time by the time my clients wake up i've finished for the day so sometimes i'll record a video send it to them to sh to walk through what I would on the call, right? That is more productive for both parties. They can watch it in their own time. I don't have to wait around till 4 p.m. to start new work, which just doesn't work for me, right? 4 p.m., like, I've clocked off. And let's be honest, anyone that works 9 to 5 has clocked off at 4. Yeah. That's <laughs> um, so why I don't work Fridays, because everyone's clocked off on a Friday. I just decided it didn't work for me. Um, but I, I mainly draw that line for I work async because – if you haven't looked at my pricing, if you don't know what I do, I don't want to talk to you because there's a huge risk that it's not beneficial to me either mon monetary wise, mon monetarily, is that a word? Uh, monetary wise, or I'm not going to learn anything. There's there's no benefit from me just going, so this is what I do. Uh, do you know what you want? And the answer is no. 
that's just a waste of my time. There's no benefit whatsoever. I'm all about exploratory calls if there's a potential for me to learn. But it's obvious if there's not, right? And it takes a, a judgment call to be like, hey, this is going to be a waste of my time. So I'm going to say, no, here's my rate card or whatever. And I have a, I have a one pager, I guess you'd call it, that says, this is what I do. This is why I charge this rate. It's actually good value. If you don't appreciate that, then look, it's not going to work. And that's my filter to get rid of the clients that I don't want. It's cutthroat, but that's my growth strategy, right? It's so that I'm not having that conversation of, here's why you should invest in content marketing. If you don't already know that, I don't want to be talking to you. I don't want to sell you the concept of what I'm doing. I want you to already be sold on that concept and then come to me because you recognize I'm good at that concept. And all of these conversations are the typical like exploratory calls or I, I, I find it funny when freelancers have the call to action on their website, book a free call with me. If it's a free call, you're insinuating there's no value. Mm. And that's the opposite of what you want to do as a freelancer. I I do paid calls with other freelancers and with some of my clients, which are genuine consultancy calls, right? Because it's taking up my time, my resources, so I should be paid for it. That's not a me thing. That's a business thing, right? And they're getting value out of it, so they should be paying for it, right? You don't go into the supermarket and take stuff. You pay for it because it has value. It's the same with real products you can hold and consultancy services. I do advocate pro bono work. And that's kind of what I mean when I say, like, if I want to just work with somebody or there's a good cause, then yeah, sure, I'll do it. But that's separate from my growth strategy. And my growth strategy is filtering out clients I don't want by ensuring it's it's asynchronous until it needs to be synchronous. And that word need has various qualifiers underneath, right? They'll be different for everybody. But mine are, are pretty strict. They're pretty rigid. Like I don't want to just chat about it because you're a chatty person. I want to do my work so that I can get on with the rest of my life, which goes back to the point you said at the beginning of the podcast, my work-life balance is heavily favored towards life. And that might sound obnoxious and it might sound a bit too strict, but if you look at how billion dollar businesses work, they survive not because they're friendly and they accept all these free calls and they do all this valueless work. They do it because they're a business, right? And they are very good at running a business. And I think everyone should run their freelance business like that. Unless you've got the freedom to just accept calls all the time. But the reality is people that were going to buy my book weren't those people. They were people that wanted to achieve that freedom. So there's a there's a method on the way to go to to getting there. And it does require a lot of change for a lot of freelancers who do take all of those calls and go, well, they've asked me to do some work, so I better do it. Saying no is very hard. Mm. But once you start and you realize the benefits of saying no, it's kind of addictive to the point where I wrote all these qualifiers and filters to be like, you, if you want to work with me, you've really got to work with me rather than I really want to work with you. I want to make my life better by working with you. I love that as an ideal. I don't think I, and, and this might be just, limited thinking, but I don't feel like I'm there quite yet, but I want, I aspire to reach your mindset and models with that. Like, I like the idea of just having a one page and, uh, you know, putting your prices right up front instead of, you know, I don't enjoy sales much. Um, oh no, I, I, I so, hate sales and that's why yeah. I just put my prices out. If, if you want to know my price is, is online, don't talk to me about it. I hate selling my <laughs> service, right? If I can't convince you in my written work to buy my written work, then don't hire me because I've not done my job well enough or you're not my target audience. Yeah. I think as a beginner, maybe, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm feeling nervous as you say these things, like when you said oh, you shouldn't do free calls. I do feel like there's something educational for me about taking any calls right now because I haven't spent um, my career taking calls. I've mostly kind of worked in the shadows on my own. so. I'll I'll have to play with that, but I like I would like to if, there, if there's a value in it for you, then you. then yeah. then do it, right? But for a lot of people, like you, all you got to do is mine Twitter, and you're like, oh, I wasted my time on a call. Yeah, but it was your time, and you are in control of it. Mm. You can send them a qualifying survey or whatever. You can send them anything really, and be like, 
hey, can you give me this information first? It will help me best prepare for the call. And it doesn't have to be, I don't want to work with you unless it's A, B, C, D. It's help me help you because that's what yeah. it is at the end of the day. You don't want to waste their time as well as your time. Unless, obviously, it's not a waste of time, then then go for it. If you're going to learn from a call you take from a, a client, I, I do a lot of stuff that I have to kind of chalk up as that was a learning experience or I might buy something and be like, oh, I didn't really want to buy that, but it is going to make me better at my craft or running a business. It might be a book, it might be a course, it might be going to a conference, which are really expensive. And I'm like, do I really want to pay five grand to get there and go there? And I'm like, this is this is horrible. Like, this is my this is my money. I'm not going like as a customer expense, but I chalk that stuff up as it's a learning experience and it's worth that either value or that amount of time that I'm putting in, which kind of has a monetary value associated with it as well. All right. So the last question I have for you is based on a quote you put at the end of your book, which I really love. And you said the first step to getting started as an autonomous freelancer is write down with a pen and paper, your perfect work day. That's it. That's the first step you're going to take. Everything else in your freelance future depends on this. As a beginner freelancer, I would love to hear you explain why you chose that and what you meant by it. So there's there's two reasons. One was so that when people finished the book, they had something to do immediately. So I wanted to give people an action. There are a few things to do in the book. Right? There's a, there's a template in there. There's an email that you can copy and paste if you buy the ebook. There's um, some links to click if you got the digital version, some books I recommend. You should do all of those, right? They're all, I included them all because they're all of value and the goal is for, me, for you to go and do those to improve your freelance business. I included that specifically at the end because my target audience for this book is people that want to actively take steps to becoming a more flexible happier freelancer and if at the end of the book you don't then go and do something it's kind of counterproductive to the entire theme of the book right so if you've read the book you understand the theory and you don't go and put it into practice it's kind of worthless and i didn't want that to be the case right i set my book at quite an expensive rate for a book but because I recognized there was value in it. I didn't want to make it a dollar on Amazon and get loads and loads of sales and go to the top. That way I wanted people to buy it on merit. And I think it's worth that amount. So I included it so that the next step would be for people to go away and think about, well, actually, yeah, what do I want to do all day, every day, but not all day, but all work day, every work day for the rest of my working life? Because that's ultimately the decision you're making, isn't it? When I quit my full-time job and decided I wanted to be a freelance content strategist, writer, whatever it is I might do, it's because I could see myself enjoying that every day for the rest of my work life. I had no problems in committing myself to that and not having any other income. I have other income streams through affiliate marketing and things like that. And I have a course and I have a book, but my primary income stream for as long as I can think of, right? This technology isn't going to go away. We're still going to make video calls. We're still going to collaborate digitally. That's not going to go away. So am I going to hate my job at any point? If I'd have picked a different niche, that might've been the case, right? Do I want to write about HR all day, every day? Absolutely not. I don't want to keep coming back to HR. I've got nothing against HR. It's just not me. <laughs> um, do I want to write about things I don't enjoy? No, I don't. Do I want to write about things that I, th I feel I have authority to speak about? Yes, I do. Do I want to write about things that interest me? Yes, I do. Video conferencing platforms like Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams and apps like Trello and Asana and Slack. They do interest me. They're always going to interest me because I'm 32 years old. I know what my interests are. They interested me five, five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. It's going to be the same. I'm not going to be like, oh, you know what? I don't find it interesting. It's like cars. I love cars. There's not going to be a point in my life where I go, <laughs> you know what? I don't care about cars anymore. I mean, I hope there's not anyway. But, and I do this exercise a lot. I write down, what do I want to do for the rest of my life, my work oh. life? pretty much. And I, I probably do it 
once every nine months, if we're being realistic, just to kind of validate that I'm still doing the right thing. And and it's everyone has a little variation. I've got it in a notepad that I'd show you if my books are better organized. Um, it's all kind of the same, slight variations. It's I want to be the freelance content marketer for the unified communications and contact center industry. Like, in fact, I think that's the very first one I wrote, and it's probably a word different to to what it is now. Um, I then kind of go off on like spider diagrams on like what do I want to do differently and who is my ideal client and things like that. But the core is always the same. Like, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? And if you can't articulate that to yourself, you're probably not ready to go all in. Man, I love so many things about that. I love that you have the uh, intuition to ask yourself, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? But then re-ask yourself, in nine months that people that change. just that people change right right but you're always i ideally looking for the thing you want to do for the rest of your life but you're also not trapping yourself in anything because it's it's good to acknowledge that we change over time as humans we go through different yeah. seasons and i you love know that on, exercise on like careers day at school you you have to write down what do you want to be when you're older <clears throat> excuse me and I think I wrote, everyone wrote down footballer, soccer player <laughs> at my school. Everybody wrote that down, right? Everyone wanted to be a soccer player. Still do. Um, but realistically, what I thought was achievable, but still in line with what I wanted to do, was write about soccer. I wanted mm. to be a journalist. And that stayed with me from, I don't know, the age of seven, eight, maybe. To today, I want to write about things I enjoy. I also appreciate that being a soccer journalist would be great. I'll get to go to the games, watch them for free, write about them. Do I want to be in the public eye as much and get slated on Twitter every time I write something someone slightly disagree with? No, I don't. Um, so it's not what's second best, but what is overall what I actually want to do. And I, I, I always revisit that because when I wrote down that I wanted to be a soccer journalist, that wasn't infinite and it didn't take me anywhere at that time. There wasn't, I didn't then go and do a course at school on how to be a soccer journalist. Did I, I still did exactly the same as everybody else. And then things changed. And I think that that applies to <clears throat> all parts of your business life as well. I love that. That reminds me of something that Tom Bill, says frequently, which is like, you can be in the world of something, right? Like you can follow your interests and still do a job that people want to pay you for, but in the world of something that fascinates and inspires you. Mm -hmm. And you did maybe not pursue the footballer part as much, but you did pursue the writing. And that's really beautiful. I think the younger version of yourself would be really happy with the life that you've built and really proud of yourself. Yeah, and reflecting back, right? I mean, I had no idea of how much money that would make. I had no idea of salaries when I was eight. Even when I was 16, I didn't know how much you could potentially earn as a soccer journalist. But I would still like to do it, right? I If, if you gave me the chance to transfer to it right now, I'd be like, yeah, I'd give that a go, like regardless of the salary, because I know that my life would be great. Like I said earlier, like I love my job. My life is great because I love my job. There are other factors to it as well, right? But a third of my day, most days, is, is a good day because I love my job. And I'm sure that I would love being a soccer journalist as well, but it plays such a big part into would I like doing that every day? And that's why I have the job that I have today. That's so beautiful. I love I'm happy for you and I'm happy that I discovered your work early on in my freelancing adventure because it gives me a North Star to work toward and I appreciate that you took the time to write a book. Um, and that book is The Autonomous Freelancer and I would highly recommend you read it if you're interested in freelancing or writing or just 
living a more purposeful life that aligns with your values, especially in the business context. I think you have some really great mindsets and tools for just thinking and being very intentional about your career and your life. And I think it's an awesome book. So definitely look for The Autonomous Freelancer. And is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people, Dominic, to follow more of your work? Uh, yeah, so you can get the book, theautonomousfreelancer.com. You can buy it as a paperback or you can buy it as an ebook if you're outside of the US or the UK in a country that that doesn't have the same kind of salary parity or why are we talking about salaries on a freelance podcast? I don't know. <laughs> I drop myself into there. Um, then the scaling will change it to whatever it should be worth in your country, which I think is quite nice. And that's why I made it available as an ebook. You can follow me on Twitter at Dom Kent or find me on LinkedIn type Dominic Kent. It's quite a unique combination of first name and surname. So I should be at the top. I'll be the one that says freelancer for Unified Comms and Contact Center. Yes, definitely give him a follow. Dominic, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me.